Back in 1905, Einstein had theorized that the disintegration of matter would be accompanied by the release of a huge amount of energy. But that hypothesis was not able to be confirmed in a lab until decades later. The process of confirming that hypothesis started in Italy in 1937, when Enrico Fermi bombarded uranium atoms with neutrons. And what he found was that those uranium atoms had fundamentally changed. The next year, German researchers did the same thing with the same results. Those uranium atoms had fundamentally changed. Now, in Germany, you have the Department of Education, or the Ministry of Education, that is hoping to be able to, to head, to lead the charge when it comes to atomic research. But the War Office would also like to be the ones in charge of atomic research. So there's a tussle. And in the end, the military got the nod. And by 1939, the German military is officially uh, researching the military applications of uranium fission. Very, very important and significant. And it didn't hurt that Germany, once it began conquering and subduing one country after the other, got its hands on all sorts of things to help in this effort. For example, when Germany took Norway, Germany got its hands on Europe's only commercial plant producing heavy water, which was necessary in the process of, um, eventually everyone knew, the, the, the goal is to create the bomb. Okay, heavy water plant from Norway. Uh, from Belgium, the conquest of Belgium, Germany got its hands on thousands of tons of uranium compounds. From France, the conquest of most of France, Germany got its hands on a cyclotron. And then you combine all this with Germany's chemical engineering know-how, which arguably was the best in the world, and Germany was well on its way to making the bomb. One of the researchers from those early German experiments, 1938, was named Lisa Meitner. She was Jewish though, so she was exiled by Hitler's regime, which is too bad for the Nazis, because she was the first person to truly understand what had happened in that lab. She was the first person to understand that those uranium atoms had been split. They weren't even uranium anymore. Well, she shared this news with Niels Bohr, in whose lab she, she went when she was exiled. She worked there. And it just so happened that Niels Bohr had already been planning a trip to the States to meet with Einstein. So he went to the States. He shared the news at a, at a news conference, and the race was on. Also, that year, that same year, Enrico Fermi, who'd helped start the whole thing, left Italy. He left fascist Italy for America. So the race was on to see who would be the first to harness the power of the split atom. You have American labs and Canadian labs and British labs and German labs all competing to see who would do it first. The Japanese also had an atomic program, much more modest than the Manhattan Project. Pretty much everything was more modest than the Manhattan Project, but led by a very competent individual. His name was Yoshio Nishina. And Dr. Nishina, he'd been building cyclotrons in the mid-1930s. He was a close associate of Einstein. He was a good friend of Niels Bohr. And he was scared to death that the Americans would develop an atomic bomb and use it to devastate his country. So he worked toward that technology himself. Now, we don't know how extensive the Japanese program was. Probably not that extensive. But in any case, it was more or less terminated by the American firebombings of Japan. The firebombings targeted more than 60 Japanese cities, leveled many of them, and in those attacks, Dr. Nishina's own lab was destroyed. But by 1940, the Germans were on their way to obtaining the bomb. They had their trained personnel, they had their chemical engineering know-how, they had their cyclotron, their heavy water plant, and all the rest. So what was the problem? Well, there were several problems, actually. First, the Germans suffered from problems of internal cohesion. There were power struggles. We've mentioned some of them already. Uh, the struggle between the war office and the scientific community associated with the project was just a constant struggle. So that doesn't help things. Second, for Adolf Hitler, the atomic program was never really a priority. He seems to have been much more interested in research on conventional type warfare, missiles and things. So that didn't help. Then, from 1941 on, of course, the Germans are busy 
losing a war in Russia. You know, when we think of World War II as Americans, we tend to think of the Western Front and the Pacific, but the vast majority of World War II took place, at least the European World War, took place on the Eastern Front. You know, 80, 90% of it, in terms of body count, took place on the Eastern Front. And so, for the atomic program, for the German atomic program, uh, what they experienced was a, a plummet in terms of resources, as everything's being diverted east to Russia. Then we can throw in a couple more things. I mean, critically, the scientists on the team made several uh, very significant scientific errors. And, of course, as the war goes on, the Allied carpet bombing campaign of German cities gets worse and worse. Just as in Japan, uh, several German cities will be firebombed into near oblivion. So none of this helps the German atomic cause. This lack of progress by the Germans was virtually unknown by the Americans and their allies. It was assumed by the Americans and their allies that the Germans were right around the corner from having that bomb. So this was a major driving force from the very beginning of the project. The Germans were thought to be very close. Speaking of American allies, I need to say something about the British contribution to the atomic effort. See, it was British scientists who years before the Manhattan Project even started, came up with the revelation, really, that only one pound of the isotope uranium-235 was needed to make an atomic bomb. Previously, it was assumed you needed many tons of uranium. Think about that difference. Many tons, one pound. Big difference there. During the Battle of Britain in 1940, Winston Churchill sent over a team of scientists, a delegation really, to try and kickstart a cooperative effort between the United States and Britain moving towards the development of the bomb. This is definitely one of the historical roots of the later Manhattan Project. And then once the project got started, of course, the British continued to make valuable scientific contributions. Well, as the Germans struggled to produce a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction, Enrico Fermi, you remember him, the Italian exile, actually did it. So he's working at the University of Chicago, and his laboratory is the unused football stadium. And there, with a group of students, over the course of a month, he stacks up, he's, already, he's got about 500 tons of graphite, 50 tons of uranium and uranium oxide, and they've cut them into these big brick-sized blocks. And then over the course of a month, they stack them up 48 layers high. So major undertaking. And then he tests his hypothesis. And it works. The world's first ever self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction had just occurred there under the football stands. So this was a major step. And that same year, really just three months before Fermi had done what he did, Army Colonel Leslie Groves was put in charge of the whole atomic program. And this is important, significant, because it was really Groves who launched the Manhattan Project itself. So if you go way back to 1939, a group of scientists, including Einstein, had written and signed a letter to FDR, trying to explain to him the latest in atomic research, its significance, and uh, to communicate maybe a little bit of urgency in that regard. Einstein, we know, was very much worried that Germany would achieve the bomb first and use it with devastation. Well, FDR was moved a little bit, and the U.S. government you know, organized a little committee and uh, granted it a little bit of a, a budget, very modest budget. But over time, as the importance of the project became more and more obvious, more and more in terms of resources was given to this committee until it had morphed into the Manhattan Engineer District of the Department of War. And this Manhattan Engineer District, the Manhattan Project, had something like 300,000 employees by the end. Researchers, scientists, other workers, 300,000. And had built, just for the purpose of the bomb, three secret cities. One was in Hanford, Washington, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the second one, and then the third here in New Mexico, Los Alamos. Leslie Groves had helped select the sites for these cities. Each city would produce something different, had its own mission. So for example, Hanford, Washington, this is where plutonium was, was produced. 
enriched uranium that would be produced in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Here in New Mexico, Los Alamos, way up to north of Santa Fe, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer would oversee the design and production of the actual nuclear weapons. And when all three of these secret cities were functioning together, it's estimated that they used about what would amount to 10% of the total U.S. electrical annual output. Now, once the device had been produced, it still had to be tested. At least that was Oppenheimer's opinion. Leslie Groves wanted to just drop it on Japan without being tested. But Oppenheimer, ever the scientist, insisted that it be tested. And so a site had to be selected. That site had to be close enough to Los Alamos to be practical, you know, for, for logistical reasons, obviously. Had to be far enough away from people, again, for obvious reasons. And it had to be on relatively flat land. And eventually, the southern New Mexico desert, at least a site in the southern desert, today we call it the Trinity site. This was, uh, the code name here is Trinity. The Trinity site was selected. And in fact, the Trinity site is just a few miles in this direction right here. Just a few miles up there. Can't get to it because it only opens to the public two days out of the year. But it's housed within the White Sands Missile Range, which is still active. But luckily within that missile range is the White Sands National Monument, where I am, where the public can go any day. And so here I am But the test site just up ahead of me. And a whole base camp had to be built. It's not like they could just go and drop it. They built a whole base camp, bunkers, roads, fences, barbed wire, instrumentation, radar, more than 50 cameras to capture the event. And by June 1945, the base camp was ready. The site was ready for the big test. All of this for one bomb, by the way, for the testing of one bomb. July 16th, 1945, that was the day. That was the day history changed. We enter a new era. The bomb was dropped. The detonation was awesome. It lit up the landscape for hundreds of miles in all directions. It created a vast mushroom cloud Researchers and military officials watching from just 10 miles away were stunned by what they saw. In fact, J. Robert Oppenheimer very famously quoted the Bhagavad Gita, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. A chilling ushering in of the atomic age. If you're interested in taking a deeper dive into history, consider one of my full courses, each including something like 400 plus pages of text, 30 plus hours of audio, 50, 60, 70 on location videos filmed all over the world, plus all the scaffolding you could ask for should you want to take it like a traditional student. We're talking guided notes, both blank and filled, quizzes, structure training, document lessons. These really are unique and one of a kind. Check them out. Also, if you want to support what I do here, consider joining Nomad Nation, where you'll gain exclusive access to monthly webinars, Q&A, a monthly newsletter called Nomad Notes, special live stream events from all over the world. I'll send you four postcards a year, discounts. Go check all this out at nomadicprofessor.com.